Hello, hello, and welcome again to a Beatles program that we call Things We Said Today. This is a weekly show, a podcast in which we talk about anything that has to do with the Beatles, the past, the present, and very often, the future. I'm Ken Michaels, also known from my other Beatles program, a syndicated show called Every Little Thing, and I'm being joined by my three regular co-hosts. First of all, we have a uh, contributing writer to Billboard magazine, also the Hollywood Reporter and AXS.com, that being Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Hello, everyone. Also, longtime writer since the very beginning for Beatle Fan magazine, that being Al Sussman. Hello, Al. Hey, Ken. Hello there, everybody. And we have our resident musicologist and freelance writer who, you know, used to work for the New York Times and is still contributing articles, so we hear, for the New York Times. And uh, also writes for Beatle Fan, that being Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hello, Ken. Hello, everyone. And we also bring back our frequent guest, Tom Franjone, who wears many hats. Uh, he writes for Beatle Fan as well. He contributes to Joe Johnson's Beatle Brunch. Uh, he helps out Mark Lapidos with the Fest for Beatle Fans. Uh, he's also a guitar player. Helps out Pat Denizio yeah. with the with the what's the name of the group? Uh, there's the Scotch Plainsmen. The we Scotch Scotch Plains, New Jersey. Okay. Yeah. And if we have any time, we might also learn about Tom's major contribution backing up. Brute force. Yeah. You might talk about <laughs> oh, that no. on the show. I didn't know about I didn't know about that. <laughs> oh yeah. There's, there's so yeah. many hidden talents behind yeah. this man. But yeah. you know, if we have four years down the road, that's right about where <laughs> I thought my life would be right now. <laughs> it's your epitaph. <laughs> on your gravestone. Yeah. It's gonna that might be the first thing mentioned. I yeah. worked with brute force. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, that, that brings the number of Apple artists whom I've jammed with, I think, up to two. He and Lon Van Eaton. Hey, that's still uh, something. Hey, Lon's a good guy. We like Lon. That's true. All right. On the show today, it's going to be mainly a lot of news items. And uh, we will be talking about the fact that, uh, and the news broke just uh, a few days ago about uh, the Beatles' performance, their 65 performance at Shea Stadium, which is actually going to be shown in theaters with the Ron Howard documentary of uh, Eight Days a Week, but before we talk about that, last week on the show, we were talking about uh, the Beatles at the Hollywood Bowl. And we had Kid O'Toole as our special guest, and Alan Cozen couldn't make it. So I thought that I would get Alan's take on the new release, what we know about it so far, as well as Tom's. And we do know that the CD and the digital release for Live at the Hollywood Bowl will actually be a week before uh, the film comes out in theaters, and then it shows on Hulu the next day. So it's actually September 9th is the release date. There'll be a vinyl release coming out in November. Uh-huh. And um, the CD and digital release will have four bonus tracks, although one of those songs came out already, but Babies in Black. It's not as if it hasn't been released before. But um, I thought we'd start with you, Alan, and uh, your thoughts about the upcoming Live at the Hollywood Bowl release and the fact that it's being reissued after all these many years. Um, okay, uh, I I haven't caught up with last week's show yet, so I don't know what uh, the rest of you have, have had to say. But um, you know, for me, it seems first of all, I mean, I, I'm glad to see the thing is finally coming out. I would rather have put at least one whole 64 show and one whole 65 show on it um, if it was going to be one CD or have all three of the shows if it was going to be two CDs. Uh, there, the tapes are out there in great quality already on the bootleg market, so you would think that they would want to compete with you know, the, the bootlegs out there. So I'm slightly disappointed that it's merely, uh, the, even though it's using new tapes, which is a, a great thing, that the first part of the album is just a recreation, uh, apparently down to the edits, of the 1977 album. And it doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever that the four bonus tracks are just tacked on at the end instead of woven into the set because, uh, you know, the thing ends with Long Tall Sally, which for several of their touring years was their final song, kind of deserves to be the final song on this set. And, 
you would think that even even though it's not going to be a real Beatles set because it's going to have stuff from 65 and 64, you would think that those four tracks should have been woven into the the running order to be kind of an idealized concert start to finish. Mm. Um, so that doesn't make any sense to me. I kind of hope that in the remaining uh, couple of months they reconsider that because I would suspect that they'd be hearing this from a lot of people. And the other thing is the cover. I mean, I know it's just the cover, but having the basically what is the film poster be the cover of the album also to me is a little disappointing. I like the original 1977 Hollywood Bowl album cover, and there are many other things you could do like that that have to do with just, for example, the Hollywood Bowl and the Beatles at the Hollywood Bowl or, you know, some sort of variation on that, but to have it just be the film poster. I mean, I understand it's a tie in for the film, but you know, this is also presumably an album of, you know, some enduring stature that is going to have a life of its own beyond the film. It it reminds me of, um, when I got an early version of the sessions album, um, when I was supposed to be writing liner notes for it, it began and ended with a little snippet of Christmas time is here again. Um, and the guy from Capitol explained to me that that was already obsolete. They were, they were taking those out, but for some reason, someone at Capitol had decided that it was going to come out for the Christmas market and they wanted that there. And it it just struck me immediately as ridiculously short sighted as if this is, it's not a Christmas album. And it, and it's an album that you would expect to play all year round. So to begin and end with Christmas Time is Here Again is just kind of silly. And someone at Capitol apparently realized that and took it off. This is like that, you know, OK, we have a film coming out, so let's tie this into the film and that will be our cover. Again, doesn't make any sense. So glad it's coming out. Not the way I would have done it, but happy to have those tracks in, in any form they want to release them. But I just think that the running order should have been different and it should have had a sensible cover. How's hmm. that? Okay. <laughs> I got some questions that I'd like to bounce off you, but I want to get Tom's take on it first. Sure. Well, I'd have to echo 95% of what Alan said about the sequencing and the completeness and the cover. A couple of different twists on it, though. Uh, I, for one, am happy that they kept the sequencing of the album itself. Because I can't believe I'm saying this, and please don't tell Bruce Spizer I ever said this. This is the <laughs> album I knew growing up. <laughs> but yeah. you know, a, a lot of people did, and it was it was uniform here and in the UK, and a, and a big hit on both sides of mm-hmm. of uh, the pond. And um, I kind of like that. And you know, George Martin was involved in in sequencing it, and you know, doing the edits. Some you know, sometimes it was you know half you know from the 1965 shows. Uh, I think it was on um, Dizzy Miss Lizzie is a composite of two songs. I kind of like it that way. But, you know, Alan's a a thousand percent right that, you know, it's not just that Long Tall Sally is the last song, you know, of the of the either the concert or this sequence. But there's a whole big, well, it's the last song of the night and we want to thank you for coming and we've got to go home and. You know, Paul, you know, they have his whole his whole spiel about this is it. It's over now. Mm. Um, from what I gather, there's a small gap after that. And then, the you know, the four um, bonus cuts come in. I'm not sure I would have woven them in there. Um, not that it's any kind of blaspheme or anything. Say, oh, my God, you can't put I want to hold your hand in right before help. Uh, um, it, it wouldn't be that because it was a, you know, a, a composite to begin with. But I think I'm going to fall back on the, the, you know, this is the way the hit album was done. Uh, what I would have done, that said, because let's face it, that, that I think, you know, pretty much puts this in the damned if you do, damned if you don't category. You know, people are going to say, I want the original sequence, but they're also going to say, we want bonus cuts. And when you're doing it on a live album, it's, it's you know, dicey unless it's a single show. Let's say this was the Shea Stadium album slash uh, film and they put everybody's trying to be my baby in its proper spot in the running order. I get that. Um, but trying to put them in, no matter how you slice this, wherever you would have put, you can't do that, or I want to hold your hand, or baby's in black, it would have been, 
however well thought out or how much you know um, you know thought went into it, um, it still would have been somewhat arbitrary. So I think the the best play probably would have been something similar to the Let It Be Naked album. Put the album out as it was, right? We still have Let It Be in all its glory, the way it, the Beatles meant it to be, and and that's not coming out. You have an alternate with the Beatles, uh, Let It Be Naked. Here, what they may have considered doing, and how I how I would have done it, would have been the album as it stands, you know, the thirty five minute album or whatever it is, and a second disc with the complete sixty four, and either or of the two nineteen sixty fives. Uh, mm-hmm. Look, we we've, we've all collected the bootlegs for years, and it's always nice to have the whole thing in case you want it. Um, but when you get into three shows, it's more than one disc, not nearly enough for two, and it's always fleshed out with things like press conferences and newsreels and things like that. And the two sixty-five shows were precisely the same set list, mm-hmm. so they, that would have created a great deal of duplication. Uh, had they done it with the the proper album, the nineteen seventy-seven album as one disc, and then a sixty-five, six, uh, sixty-four, sixty-five complete shows on another disc. Um, just doing a little bit of, of counting here. They did 12 songs at each in each uh, set in 64 and 65, so it's 24 songs. Only three were repeats, Twist and Shout, Hard Day's Night, and Can't Buy Me Love. So you'd still end up uh, with very little repetition, uh, which is good. And you wouldn't have that really weird um, sense that, you know, Long Tall Sally was the last song, and they came on and did like, four songs for an encore. Um, <laughs> and, you know, Long Tall Sally was the, you know, obviously it was the, the closer in 64. And um, having an, an alternate closer, you know, I'm Down, which was the, the closer uh, for most of the 65 and 66 tour, would have given, I think, a real good saleability to it. Alan brings up a great point that this thing has to have some legs. So a lot of duplication of having both 65 shows might have cut into that you know, into the cachet that this whole thing brings. And, you know, speaking of the legs, uh, one of the things that Alan, uh, I think, was getting toward on the cover, the cover, to me, is going to present some confusion to people, if not right now, when there's a lot of press around it, um, a year from now, two years from now, five years from now, where it says in big banner letters across the top, the Beatles live at the Hollywood Bowl. And right smack in the middle, you know, the movie, you know, eight days a week. People are going to say, was was that movie about the Hollywood Bowl? Or or, is, or they might look at the movie and say, uh, or the soundtrack album and say, is this the soundtrack to that movie? And and neither one of those is the case, obviously. Or um, is Eight Days a Week even on it? Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sure ain't the title song. We don't. <laughs> um, and especially when the DVD, I'm assuming that there will be a DVD or yeah. Blu-ray of some kind, if the DVD has exactly the same cover. Yeah, and you know that might have been like a good place to put a sticker. You know, uh, yeah. you know r- make sure you you know check out the eight days a week Ron Howard thing. Um, but I'm not sure that 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 you know titling right in the middle does the does this package any justice. Just to let you know, uh, I know Alan was a big fan. I'm gonna try and do something here with the camera. If you look over my shoulder, there you can see what what framed album cover is standing there in the background, right? Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah, that's I one like of my both. favorites. I love that album. That, that, that's about as far as I can get this camera. But uh, I always loved that album, uh, mm-hmm. the Hollywood Bowl. I mean, it's it was the only time, or uh, not only, but the first time I had a chance, you know, at age 15, and you go do the math later, uh, to go and get my the first time I went and got a new Beatle album, you know, upon release. Uh, mm-hmm. It was exciting, mm-hmm. and I listened to that album and wore out copies of the LP and the cassette uh, in my high school days, and I still enjoy that album tremendously. Mm-hmm. So you know the cover the cover yeah. issue is is disappointing to me. Recognizing that they had a you know at least three ways they could have done this, they could have put out the original album, or they could have done what they're doing now with some bonus cuts, or they could have put it out as a double, as we just uh, described it, or they could have gone with some deluxe, you know, all three shows. And however they broke that up, you know, the 65s on one, the 64s on another, um, there, there were just entirely, you know, there's a whole good list of ways they could have done this. Uh, and there's one more they could have actually done, which I don't think we've talked about yet, is, you know, after the four bonus cuts that they are giving you, and Ken is correct that, you know, only three are previously unreleased, despite what the press release says, there are four more titles 
culled right, from, right. The, from the shows that there's more than enough room on uh, on the discs to do. I mean, certainly mm-hmm. if you can get 24 tracks on the two discs, you can get 21. Uh, mm-hmm. So we, we lose I Feel Fine and If I Fell and I Want to Be Your Man and I'm Down uh, along the way. So had they done a, a super deluxe single disc, right, 21 cuts, I mean, then you go nuts and you say, boy, th- this is really terrific. This, this is really super. Uh, mm-hmm. You'd get about a seventy-minute, you know, uh, give or take a seventy-minute disc uh, of you know all the songs from both shows, however they'd be sequenced. But you know, it's it's a difficult it's a difficult uh, thing to realize now is that this is probably the last we'll see or hear of a Hollywood Bowl release. I don't think a year from now they'll say, oh, you know, we heard what you guys said, and here's both shows. Don't think that's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, it's interesting though, and you know. This is purely just an idea, but and not at all a prediction. But the labeling of the the eight days a week on the center of this. If you think back to how the anthology was done, you look at those three anthology covers. For sure, you know they're part of the same project. Okay, they're three mm-hmm. different pieces mm-hmm. of the same puzzle. This may be, and again, this is pure speculation. But picture that same cover next year and right across the top it says the Beatles live at Chase Stadium or the Beatles live at Budokan Hall. Mm -hmm. Um, These could all now be considered part of one project, the Beatles live release chronology for lack of a better term. But who knows? And I I thought that the first time I saw the album cover or what we believe will be the album cover and I was saying, boy, that's not really that far a stretch when you consider that they're, they're putting Shea Stadium out in the theaters with it. And to Al's uh, hypothesis here about a future DVD release, will that be part of it too? Mm-hmm. Right? Maybe maybe that's part of it too. There's not really a proper Hollywood Bowl film. I mean, mm-hmm. there's newsreel footage that people have synced up and things like that. Mm-hmm. But uh, is that part of part of that package? Again, big question mark. No, I, I agree with you on the on the tie in there, Tom. I think that's. I think that's not a big stretch at all. Um, I, I think something will definitely happen. Um, the question is what? So. And of, of course, in terms of a proper soundtrack album, that thing will be, it'll finish airing on Hulu, and about 90 seconds later, that thing will be floating. Ah, oh, of course. You know, that, <laughs> that, that, that's a gimme. Yeah. Well, I would say, based uh, you know, a lot on what you said, Tom, and this would be my wish, it, it doesn't matter to me how the 77 album came out. I never minded bouncing around from a 64 performance to a 65, back to 64 like that. Um, either do it like that, and like you said, Tom, include those other four songs that aren't represented. And if yeah. you've listened to the bootlegs, If I Fell, I think, came out, it was superb. <laughs> I mean, not only that, but that's one, one primary example of, despite hearing all these screams, you can still hear them harmonize really well. On yeah, it, you know, it kind of recalls this boy from um, from the Washington D.C. Yeah. shows and the mm. Salt shows. You know, they right. still, you know, they still intuitively were, you know, were so locked in um, that it that it made it sound good. So, and and you know, that's one of the ones that you don't really think of as you know a staple of the live shows. You never see it really in in films. But actually, I'm, I'm sure you guys probably peeked in last night, because it's always better on TV than on DVD, uh, when the Turner Classics last night showed A Hard Day's Night mm-hmm. on TV. And, you know, my favorite song or my favorite, you know, portion of that movie is the first song of the, you know, the final show that they do, you know, when it all gets together and they do and tell me why, because mm. it's clearly a song they never did live, uh, not even on BBC Radio. And you say, wow, this is really cool to to hear them, obviously it's the record, but to, wow, it's cool to see them doing Tell Me Why. Yeah, right, you see them right. do She Loves You in virtually every concert film. Right. Um, but wow, seeing them do Tell Me Why, how cool was that? Um, so mm-hmm. If I Fell being part of that that TV set um, you know, that they do at the end of Hard Day's Night, when I was watching it last night and they, they uh, segue into If I Fell, I said, oh, that... That, I'm really going to miss that on a Hollywood Bowl album. That should have been there. Yeah. Well, I would have preferred if they had either just a single disc with all the songs represented between 64 and 65, mm-hmm. like you were suggesting, Tom, or have one complete 64 show and one complete 65 show, which could all fit on one disc. And you would have yeah, all the so. songs represented. 
Yeah, I so, know. No, it would be a great <laughs> idea if that were ever done. I mean, you know, what kind of sick and twisted mind would think of that? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what they could do? I mean, taking Tom's idea one step further, since, you know, a double disc set is going to cost what a double disc set costs, no matter what's on it, basically. Right. They could have had the 64 show, the 265 shows, and then for people who are fond of the 1977 album, fill out the second disc with the 1977 album. It's repetition, yeah. it's fine, but there are, you know, people are are fond like as as Tom is of of that sequence that album mm -hmm. it's sound so and you know when you have half a disc to waste anyway and so on that point Alan you know it's not without precedent remember mm -hmm. they did that with the mono and stereo boxes when they put out the 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 87 CD mixes right mm -hmm. um you know on a you know stereo mixes on a mono on what's otherwise a mono box yeah, uh, to have the alternate version there, or the you know the latter day uh, or the revisionist version, whatever label you want to put on it. So it's really not without precedent either. Mm -hmm. it's true. Yeah, I was going to ask based on the live performances that we've seen and heard, whether it's bootleg, you watch it on YouTube, whatever. Do you really think that the Hollywood Bowl represents their best live performance? I mean, obviously, we'd have loved to have had anything from Hamburg. Besides the Star Club, you know, mm -hmm. something that was bored quality, obviously. But of what we have heard, would you say the Hollywood Bowl really represents their best live performance? I'm, I'm not sure I would say that. I, I, mm. If we're talking about concerts as opposed to live on TV, I think, you know, the boy that the end of 63 there when they were doing that um, that Swedish TV drop in. Show. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. they, they were on fire there. Yeah. In terms of a concert setting, I mean, you got to go to distance to beat Washington D.C. Yeah, mm -hmm. they, really. I mean, they, they brought it that night, um, mm -hmm. and it was so new and so fresh, and no one knew what to make of it. And what was kind of cool is it wasn't the the standard tour set list. You know, you were getting "Please Please Me" in there. You were getting this roll over Beethoven, roll over Beethoven, mm -hmm. right? George leading off the concert, right? Yeah. How about that? Just start there. Yeah. Um, you know, there there is a lot of good. A lot of good energetic performances in there. You know, Shay is great. I mean, Shay, you know, we're just we're so used to seeing it, you know, uh, you know, whether it be on the bootlegs or on the, the movies or some of the tapes that have been around. Certainly they're better there than they are anywhere on the sixty six tour. As for Ugh. I mean the sixty six Paris sixty five is great. Maybe Paris better sixty five is dynamite, yeah. Yeah. But you know, certainly by sixty six and we we all know the stories and I'm sure this will be part of your, your revolver. Uh, show, you know, they mm -hmm. finished mixing Revolver. They didn't even rehearse for that tour. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. And did nothing from the new album. They really couldn't have cared less about the 66 tour. Mm -hmm. But the, the 64 um, Washington, D.C. Is, is a dynamite live concert show. Mm -hmm. And some of the, the British and European TV stuff from the end of 63, certainly, you know, they're, they're, as, you know, they're at the top of their game. Mm -hmm. And some of those TV performances are amongst their best. Oh, yeah. I mean, they, not only did they perform well, but you didn't have the screaming as loud. Well, yeah, I mean, so, well, mm -hmm. you know, Blackpool is yeah, it's not that just that it sounds better, but they could hear it better. And that that goes a long, long way. Yeah. yeah. Huh. Al, any thoughts on this on uh, Hollywood Bowl? Yeah, well, I think it probably since, you know, Tom mentioned the fact that, you know, that was the first new Beatles album that he was able to, to get, you know, cause I, he was a little, little too young to, uh, uh, have experienced the, the sixties albums. Uh, so I think in that respect, and there's, you know, there's a lot of people that are in that, uh, in that same, that same age range who, you know, had the same experience. So it's probably best that they do release at least the, you know, the, the audio portion of the Hollywood bowl album, in its in its original form, and then tack on the four uh, the, the four bonus tracks. Even though they don't really make any um, sort of thematic uh, sense, because as Tom said, uh, you know, Paul is saying you know saying good night and everything, and doing one to all Sally, and then uh, and then come four more songs, and you know which makes no sense. But the purists who remember the Hollywood Bowl album in its original form would be going crazy if they had simply blended in 
those four extra tracks. I think yeah. that's, and the, uh, you know, and the, the cover, I mean, a cover is a cover, you know, it's especially these days where, you know, the physical form is, you know, is, is a CD, you know, it doesn't really make that much of a difference. I mean, you can, you know, people can easily just simply take, as, as I'm sure Tom knows, uh, you know, just simply take a, you know, a snap, a snapshot basically of a, you know, of the LP cover and, uh, you know, size it down and put it in a CD jewel box or whatever you're going to use. And you've got the original cover. You know, if that if it means if it means that much to you, I, I think the the fact that the the album itself has been remastered or remixed, whatever, from the from the original three track masters, I think that counts for a lot. And from seeing one review that I saw over the weekend that I believe Tom sent around uh, from Wad. Wog blog. Yeah, it, it sounds as if the the sound on the on the album is extremely good, and that the and that the crowd isn't quite as intrusive as it was on the the on the original LP. So mm-hmm. um, so you know from that standpoint, that's certainly that's certainly a positive because because you know there there seems to be this uh, kind of um, uh, negative reaction that um, uh, from certain members of the hardcore that uh, that the average uh, you know sort of rank and file Beatle fan is not going to like this album because it's a live recording and that the performances aren't their best and that it really should have been, uh, you know, more of a, you know, hardcore archivist release with uh, the complete shows and da, 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 da. You know, whether, you know, how it is as, as a listening experience, I think is up to uh, the individual listener. Well, in a way, the fact that you have all that screaming... It's a document of that time. Yes, exactly. You know, so it really gives you an idea of what the Beatles were going through. I mean, yes, strictly on a performance level, I'd like to hear just the band and nothing else yeah. and, and playing course. live. But that's not the way it was, and that's not no. the way they heard it. You mm-hmm. know, they could barely hear themselves in the first few years there, right. 64 and 65 especially. So yeah. you really get a taste of what it was like for them. Yeah, the, sure. only, the only down moments really would be and I know I Feel Fine is not in the collection, but if you ever listen to I Feel Fine from the Hollywood Bowl, you hear the screaming at a point where George is doing his lead guitar part before they yeah. get the next verse, and you can barely right. hear it. Yes. When it's the whole band, you can hear everything. But when mm-hmm. it's just you know one part, it's sometimes it's hard to hear just that, single that out. Yeah. So mm-hmm. that's when it suffers. But overall, the fact that you hear the band at all above this yeah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's just something to be grateful for, and it makes you realize even when they couldn't hear themselves, they were so locked in. They really, yes. oh, yeah. I mean, they could have done this in their sleep. Oh, yeah. and, and and I suppose in '66 they were doing that anyway. You know whether they had that oh, yeah. to it or not, but they were mm-hmm. so good that it didn't really matter whether they heard themselves or not. They can still do at least a passable performance, and in most cases, it was far better than that. Uh, but I, I, I will second Tom's point that the that the Washington Coliseum is probably the single best example of what the Beatles were like as a performing band. In a they concert were, setting, yeah. They were just incredibly on that night. I can remember back in '64, reading Michael Braun's account in a in a well, it was done in a magazine in in, in the U.S., but it was the uh, the book. Uh, called Love Me Do that Michael Braun uh, wrote, which was really the first kind of really honest account of of the Beatles during their rise to world uh, to world fame. And Ringo, after the Washington Coliseum concert, I mean, he's pl- he's playing like he's possessed. <laughs> and he said after the show, he said, I could have played for these people all night. <laughs> wow. He, yeah. Ringo definitely brought it that night. Oh, oh yeah. You know, yeah. Despite the fact that every two or three songs he had to get up and move the drums, yeah. Yeah. 
<laughs> I think for that show, you want not just an album of it, though. You want the video because yes. the video also adds Very a dimension true. that, you yeah. know. Mm-hmm. Uh, can I offer a couple of cantankerous comments? <laughs> sure. Okay. You know, I, I, keeping in mind, I mean, I like the 1977 album. I obviously got it when it came out, listened to it a lot. I, you know, it's, I, I, I'm not, I don't really mean to diss that album when I am, in fact, about to diss that album. Um, <laughs> You know, from my, said. <laughs> from my point of view, um, this was an album that came out in 1977, seven years after the Beatles broke up. And it was, an, let us say, an early attempt at an archival release. And so to me, it doesn't have the kind of stature that one of the actual Please Please Me Through Let It Be albums had. To mm-hmm. me, it, it, it could just as well be the Beatles' Rarities album. And nobody particularly is saying, well, you know, I don't know. We don't have the Rarities album. All those mono tracks that were on there got put on the mono set or on the, you know, other things. And, you know, we're never going to get the Rarities album. And we don't need the Rarities album right. because, in effect, it's been replaced. Mm-hmm. And you could replace the Hollywood Bowl album in the same way, you know, or you could put it out as an archival release, you know, simply saying this is what we put out in 1977, but still then have the shows. Because I think there is something to be said for a complete Beatles show start to finish that in a way Hollywood Bowl doesn't give you because it's a composite. Mm -hmm. You know, the Washington Coliseum film does and it's out there on iTunes. And But, you know, there are, apart from Washington Coliseum, there is nothing close to being officially released that tells you what a Beatles set was like from start to finish. And Mm -hmm. Since these were not, you know, there were no play. Okay, the 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 sixty six shows, I could see them being maybe a little bit embarrassed about putting out. Although, you know what, there are the sixty six shows, so you know, I think people who follow their career arc know the whole story about how they didn't particularly care. But these are documents of that time. But the sixty four and sixty five Hollywood Bowl shows, I mean, there's nothing embarrassing there, you know. So. Um, I don't know. That that's my. I think, I think that that's my view of it, and that the I'm, I don't really have a particular reverence about the 1977 album. It's it's an after the fact album for me anyway. It's nice. Mm-hmm. Liked it. I like the cover. Um, and uh, yeah, and and also I was thinking, you know, when Al, you said that okay, you know, so the cover is the cover. Who cares? You can yeah. put your cover on, but. Then you said that, um, and they've they've used the master tapes and they've cleaned it up, and now there's less screaming on it. Well, if if people are going to be nostalgic about the 1977 album as such, why wouldn't they be nostalgic about more screaming? You know, in other words, it's well, it, you know, you know <laughs> I, I I could give you a perspective on that, Alan. Sure. And having been you know uh, a few years behind the curve, okay, I was about 15 when that came out, as I said. Mm-hmm. I think you're correct that it was the first pass at a at a you know an archival release or a dip into the vaults. But at the same time, it was very much riding a wave of renewed Beatlemania. Mm-hmm. Um, after Paul toured and the rock and roll music album, and heck, a, a a song that was never a single off of a little album called Revolver made the top ten. All right. that stuff is going on in '76. Mm-hmm. It kind of it kind of validated some seven years down the road, that the Beatles were still viable, that they were, you know, and of course, any conversation like this always ended with, well, gee, do you think they'll get back together? But at that time, I think it it kind of kept stoking the fire that was, you know, Beatlemania a la mid-70s that had come on, you know, it was, you know, there was a bit of a hangover from the 73, 74 um, glory period of the solo records. And then the, you know, wings breaking through, you know, in America, you know, on tour in 76. And I say all those, you know, the Beatles are back in the top 10. I think that was that was kind of a response or, you know, a a way to stoke that that flame, too. So I think it was a bit more than just a a dip into the archive. I think Mm -hmm. people knew the Beatles were here come the air quotes history at that. (laughs) They were viewing them as as history. But still somehow being very very relevant yeah that this industry is based on 
you know, if you have success at any time with any kind of an idea, you want to bounce off that and do oh, yeah. it very quickly. I mean, who knows? We might not have had rock and roll music had the Red and the Blue albums not done as well. Mm -hmm. right? You know, sure. so it all played off each other. The, the success of uh, the solo Beatles helped the Beatles albums and vice versa. So, yeah, definitely. I do have to say that, that uh, the point you made, Alan, is so true about, you know, it, you get so much more out of watching a concert from start to finish and knowing how great the Beatles were live that way, then, uh, well, I do love hearing the audio, but it's far more effective if you watch the Washington Coliseum show. Mm -hmm. But I made the point last week that to the general public that don't study the Beatles at all, they have no idea what a great band they were live. Mm -hmm. And I do believe that is, you know, partly the Beatles' fault for not releasing stuff that is in the vaults, probably because they felt that it just wasn't good enough. Or That's true. you know but they were they I weren't think the proud BBC of it. The BBC albums took a nice bite out of that apple, oh no, Ken? Yeah. You know, the Beatles mm -hmm. live at the BBC. I mean, even though those were by and large not done in front of concert audiences, right? They were all intents and purposes live, you know, under the best conditions where you could hear just the band. Mm -hmm. uh, I know, but I think to the general public, they don't think unless they hear an audience, <laughs> they yeah. don't think of it as a live performance. Right. It's called live yeah. at the BBC, and they're done in one take. You know, in most cases, so it they were really live, but I think it do, it doesn't have the feel of a live recording without having an audience. Yeah. So I don't think people look at it as a live album, you know. But you know, we talked about all these other performances, you know, the Shea Stadium, Budokan, whichever ones you want, and you know, I just don't see why in all these years it, it you know they haven't been released. We've known that they cleaned up the video for Shea, and now it's going to be in the theaters, which is a good segue here. But why does it take all this long for it to... Uh, and in fact, we don't even know if the Shea performance is actually going to come out physically. So, right. you know, everything takes forever. Um, it could just be yeah. that they're so meticulous and they want everything to be so perfect, and they care about their image, which is another thing I wanted to bring up, because a few, a few shows ago... We were talking about the Beatles Inner Circle. And we brought up Neil Aspinall. And from, from what I heard about Neil, he was just so very protective of the Beatles. And he wanted that catalog and the memories to be perfect to the point where you don't release below par stuff. And so I've often said it's miraculous that the Beatles anthology CDs came out, as well as the BBC stuff. But, you know, I just don't think, and I, believe me, I hope I'm wrong here. I just don't think there's going to be a lot from the vaults that Apple will release. Because, I don't know if it's something that the Beatles feel themselves. Maybe Neil helped instill that in them. But, you know, the Beatles have such high standards. And part of the reason why they're still so popular to this day, and you still have new young audiences discover them, is because that catalog is so strong the way it is. And maybe by putting out something that's considered below par, it might tarnish their reputation a bit. So, you know, we've talked about this before, but if you guys have, have any feelings about this... Plus, there may be, in a sense, almost... And this is something, this is a charge that some of the hardcore people have been making, that that there's basically, it's it's laziness on the part of on the part of Apple, uh, that, that it's just, it's easier for them to simply quote unquote, lower their standards and shoot for the quote unquote mainstream mm -hmm. with, uh, you know, with releases like this, uh, because, you know, uh, because of the, well, frankly, because of this, because the success of one and it's ongoing success they feel that supposedly it's easier to simply to not go all out in a sense with, you know, with archival multi-disc archival releases in the way that, that say Bob Dylan or Bruce Springsteen or, uh, you know, various other, uh, the who Elton John, various other, what they call heritage artists have done. Mm. That it's simply easier to to go the easy route. Just put out, you know, a disc with it already that 
you know, an, an already existing album or another repackaging of some kind. Yeah, but you know what? You know that no, the Beatle catalog would start looking like the Beach Boy one pretty soon. Yeah, and exactly. You know, the Beach Boys are yeah. doing some real nice things over the past couple of years, like that. Uh, was it the Party album last year? They did the mm -hmm. lead sessions, and they they did a nice job with that. But you know, to repackage them, I mean, you guys remember after the one came out, and they said, "Oh, what are they going to do next?" And Ringo said, "Oh, we're going to do with the, you know, all the number twos. Which, by the way, would be a real short record. I think. Yes, very short. <laughs> so most most people, people grabbed, don't know that. You know. Right, but people grabbed hold of that and said, "That's going to be next. Like that's probably the next best group of Beatles. Like, it's stupid. Mm. What is that album about? It would basically yeah. just be Penny Lane, right? I mean, no, well, no. Penny Lane makes no makes the one album. Yes, Penny Lane mm. was number one. Yeah, but remember the the well that that's because the one album sort of right. uses weird. But but remember the story was that Penny Lane didn't make it to number one well, in England, uh, in, England yeah. in the UK. So right. yeah, so that's the only one that I think only made it up to number two and didn't get up to number one. So that not be... true, not true. Really, is that true? No, uh, in America, there were a number. It, of them. It, yeah. Do you want to know a secret? Went to number two. Uh, Yellow Submarine <laughs> went to number two. Twist and Shout, I think. Yes. But Yellow Submarine is on the one album. Remember, you got to do US, UK. Okay. I'm, well, right. I was thinking you. All right. Okay. You made Easy. Easy. <laughs> okay. Well, it would be a short album, anyways. It, I think I counted it once. It was like six songs. Okay. So, but people, to the point here, you know, like, who would, it's a stupid collection. Why would anybody do that? Um, <laughs> but playing to the uh, the lowest common denominator as it was. Oh, did they make it a, did they expand the one album? And on the front, it's a big, I don't know, a 10. All the Beatles' top ten singles, and now it's a double album. I don't know. Well, that's what they did with Elvis. No, oh, I know. Oh well, God, do, yes. Do you want yeah. you want the Beatle catalog to look like that? Well, I you heard. Know, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, the, <laughs> with Elvis, it's a little different. But you know, they have the that uh, follow that dream series where you basically will have the whole original album and then maybe three other discs of of outtakes. And really, that wouldn't bother me as if for the Beatles to have um, yeah. if that were possible. But as Tom said, when in he was just talking about Let It Be and Let It Be Naked. The original albums are always there, no matter what archival stuff they put out. Right. And uh, I, usually. I would love to just <laughs> see more archival stuff that shows more about what happened. And I, I understand they feel, you know, some things are substandard that we don't feel are substandard. And so, obviously, who's right? Them or us? Clearly mm -hmm. us. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it's, it's not a matter well, of better. I think, I think people kind of kind of have to you know trust that if the beatles put out whichever take number it was of hey jude okay mm -hmm. yeah maybe they were onto something that record came out all right you know there might be an alternate where we say wow you know he phrased it a little differently and how cool that is but you know right you know they're the artists they get they get to pick that right that's true but okay. when they were doing the anthology they were saying at that themselves they were saying hey this is actually a pretty good version well, too. I mean, that that goes mm -hmm. way way back it goes way before anthology i mean you go back to the abbey road show in 83 i mm -hmm. i mean yeah. i went to that thing and the first time i heard while my guitar gently weeps acoustic i i was i was floored i mean it mm. had no words mm -hmm. that it sounded that different you know, I mean, you know, look, you, you don't expect that the first time he wrote it, he called the band in and said, OK, here are the chords. Follow me on this. Um, you know, he wrote it on a on a guitar and but that it was much more gentle. I mean, you know, you guys obviously have heard this a million times. Mm -hmm. uh, and so most of the people listening to this show, the difference between the demo there and the finished product, it's a marked transformation of what it set out to be. Mm. You know, not always the case. I mean, you listen to some of the White Album demos for I don't know junk even you know a, a solo song. The final version is a very close cousin to the you know to the demo. He kind of mm -hmm. had that idea in his mind what he wanted it to sound like. But that being said, you know, you know you get the idea when you listen to Let It Be Naked and particularly the what is it the fly on the wall disc again the <laughs> the, the great missed opportunity of all time. Yeah. It's clear that this is not the official Beatle album that it is the that it is the alternative. It's the choice. So, you know, who knows what they're going to do with the major album anniversaries that are just right around the corner, you know, Pepper, mm. White Album, and Abbey Road. Um, you know, will there be, you know, a a bonus disc of the, you know, the rough takes or the demos? Who knows? 
Um, they've given us no no reason to hope that that will happen, uh, at least not based on a couple of okay albums like Rubber Soul and Revolver. Yeah. So, you know. Well, uh, when have they really honored anniversaries? Well, I, I mean, I, A Hard Day's Night was shown in theaters, but then they didn't know that. But 19, the, the 50th anniversary of 64, a couple of years ago, they couldn't let that go. Okay, and they put out the American box, and that was probably the right thing to put out because it was a decidedly American anniversary. The Ed Sullivan Show and the British Invasion and all that. So, yeah, it, oh, it, it's really rare that they do. Mm. Uh, I think the last time I remember them doing an anniversary, Ken, might have been when they made it their business to put out Sergeant Pepper. I was going to say that. Yeah, yeah. On the when the CD came out. Yeah, <laughs> because they got to say, guess what? It was 20 years ago today. We right. Even they couldn't screw that up, mm -hmm. you know. But, yeah, uh, but yeah, they're, they're not in love with drawing attention to anniversaries and numbers. That's, and No. That's for sure. It tells people, hey, this is 50 years ago. That was ages ago, you know. Yeah. The, the, the message I hear with that is, you know, this was 50 years ago, and you still hear this just as much on the radio as anything that was put out last month. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Gotta be doing something right. Steve? Can I make a point? Yeah, can I make Please. a point about the? Yeah, uh, I, thought, yeah. I think my mic went off. I don't know. Um, I was gonna say I thought you had disappeared. Yeah, 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 no, yeah. No. Last week I mentioned something, and and Tom, uh, since you're here, I can bounce this off of you. I'm surprised you were talking about the Beach Boys catalog, and I'm surprised that they didn't do a special version, a deluxe version of Hollywood Bowl, and maybe a deluxe version of of all you know of more than one concert you know venue which may actually be what they're planning somewhere down the road but but you know i'm surprised that they at least for the bowl they didn't do a a bigger uh you know uh, put both kind of those 64 and 65 concerts like you were talking about earlier mm -hmm. and i i'm just i i really think they especially given you know you were sitting here talking about the, the different factors and why they didn't do it and and you know, one of the things I was thinking of was the you know the the foursome themselves, the the hierarchy didn't couldn't come to an agreement. But mm. but the other thing obviously would have been with the record company before it, and and given what you said about the Beach Boys, and given all the Beach Boys releases, you would think that Universal would have been would have been fine with that. You know, I I that it's weird. I. You know, I, we're, we're, I somehow, I somehow well, Universal think... would be, but but Universal can't do anything without the Beatles' permission. Right. Yeah, but right. You know what? They mm -hmm. they brought in a guy like like um, Jeff, Jeff Jones. Jeff Jones. Jeff Jones. Because he's he he really knows. He's a great record guy. He knows how to how to do reissues. He know mm -hmm. he knows how to keep the balance between what's saleable and what's important and mm -hmm. what the diehards are going to want. I mean. You don't really have to look much further than the, the reissues you did, let's say, for the birds back yes. in uh, CBS days. Those were fantastic. It, you know, when he when they brought him in, I was real happy because I said, here's a guy who knows how to mine a catalog. And, you know, by and large, what they have put out, I've, I've been very happy with. I think every time they put something out, they they did a real good job with what they set out to do. In this case, they're going to do a real good job with what they set out to do. I just don't think what they set out to do captured really what was important particularly to the fans what was important to the whole story you know balancing mm -hmm. that that latter day history that 1977 you know beatlemania redux and capturing the essence of the original shows it, it you'd need more real estate than they're giving it right now right and yeah and that's kind of i mean that's kind of what you know that was my thought too. I, I will say, and I ta and I mentioned this on Facebook again. I'll tell you, uh, and I, you weren't here when I, we talked about it last time. After my trip to Southern California, when I went through the studios, walking in that room and seeing those tape boxes of Hollywood Bowl <laughs> sitting on the shelf, that yeah. was that was something. That was uh, that was a mind blower. My wife will tell you. I was talking about that for hours after. Uh, I bet. <laughs> But yeah. yeah, I mean, but yeah, I, I still I, maybe 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 the plan is somewhere down the road to to do something, you know, yeah. maybe they'll coordinate. Maybe maybe the plan is to do this thing gradually and get it all together at the end. I don't know. You would think, no, though, that they would have come up with a better plan. But maybe uh, I do think that we will see Shay at some point. I don't know how, but I do think it, it I just... know a couple. It doesn't make any sense. I'm sorry. It doesn't make any sense that they would do all this work restoring Shea Stadium and not releasing it. 
Right. Does well, it make right. sense to show it in the theater and then not release it? Well, you remember right. they they cleaned oh, yeah. this up, you know, twenty years ago. Yeah. During the anthology, That's true. Uh, mm-hmm. as as they did for Let It Be, um, mm-hmm. and the bits that we saw in the anthology even then looked mm-hmm. phenomenal and right. sounded right. phenomenal. And, and it's probably better now. You, you got to probably yeah, cleaned it up more. They've read. Mm-hmm. They have. They've made a four K version, and mm-hmm. and we saw some of that in. In that eight days a week clip, uh, yeah. that's interestingly enough. Yeah. I want, Steve, what are you hearing about whether it will come out when the DVD of the film comes out? There have been a couple of people, and, and I'm not going to mention names, but there have been a couple of people who have apparently talked and said, no, it's not going to come out when the DVD comes out. But my suspicion is that they will do something down the road. I mean, they almost have to. They can't let, I mean, although the precedent for, I mean, look what happened with Washington. They didn't do anything. They just left it on iTunes, which to this day still surprises me that they didn't put that out. Mm -hmm. Um, It's ridiculous. But maybe, maybe the plan is now that they're doing all this live stuff is to, to put it out. Maybe at some point, maybe, you know, uh, we don't know, for example, what's coming out at Christmas. This is not the Christmas release. At least I'm not considering it the Christmas release release so who knows who knows what's going you know what's and going pres- and presumably the a dvd for eight days a week yeah like, would time out pretty much right in the middle of the christmas market mm-hmm. so but 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 the advance word is from a couple of people mm. who who claim to have talked to apple is that it's not going to happen but I'm that, I'm that there's not going to be a DVD for eight days a week, or there's or no 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 no. Shea I, would, Stadium. I would I would think there's going to be a uh, no Shea Stadium. Okay, it's not going to come out. But that's what they're saying. I can't see them putting this in the theater and letting it go like that. I really can't. Although interestingly enough, they're not showing it on Hulu. So. You know, I mean, there's there's a couple of things to consider. It's hard to predict. I mean, we know that, I mean, they've never been, you know, they've never done anything, I shouldn't say logically, but I mean, on, an, you know, you, we've never been able to tell, you know, they've surprised <laughs> us. I mean, the Shea was a surprise. I mean, the Shea caught everybody by surprise. I didn't, I honestly didn't think they'd, te- they'd do the Shea thing this way. Hey, if listen, anything, the Beatles anything, won, the Beatles won plus took me by surprise. To have all the videos out. Yeah, I thought that was right. a great release. Well, yeah. I mean, I we all knew. Well, we all knew that was coming eventually. I mean, it wasn't that big a surprise. But hey, they could uh, take this, forever if they want to. So. Yeah. Well, and, and again, we have to. You know, you've got the you've got the four parties that have to agree. So I mean, it's it, it's going to be tough. But I think that something will happen with Shay. Maybe not with the DVD, and I would be amazed if they. I, I I think that's a strange decision not to do it with the DVD. A very strange decision. That would really uh, help the DVD sell if it was packaged together. Right. I mean, look yeah. look for look for example, and this is not uh, probably not the best example, but that Frank Sinatra HBO special that right. uh, came out uh, was it last year. Mm-hmm. You, could buy the blu-ray of the special by itself which was like three hours long but you could also buy an expanded version in uh, a box set that had a tv interview with him vintage tv interview and it had um another concert and it had a bunch of document you know uh, books and stuff so you know that would make sense you know that would make sense i mean that's the kind of thing that people would would buy in a minute I don't understand why the small package with the CD. It doesn't. That just doesn't register. Well, that, except that, you know, playing devil's advocate, they can point to the fact that the that One Plus was the, the first time that a release of the One album didn't do all that well. Now, the reason why it didn't do all that well is because they're you know they put out too many different formats and it was very confusing. But they can point to that and say, "See, if we do it the uh, you know go the deluxe route, it's not gonna it's not gonna sell as well. So it's easier for us to just go the easy route and just put out just put out the movie, or just limit the choices. I mean, the 
the yeah. one plus I, I imagine you guys bought the one i did right the would right the remix cd and the double dv mm -hmm. no. yeah mm -hmm. okay you know it's it's much like pure mccartney right there was the, the short version, the long version, the vinyl version. Let's not get into pure McCartney. Well, yeah. okay, just Why go. not? Let's <laughs> <laughs> be sure to stop by the Fest for Beatles. Yes. Be, be, uh, be lighting that one up, as well as the Hollywood Bowl. Please, uh, you know, if you if listen. Well, the, or... You know, the one album also had the problem. I mean, you know, whatever you can say about the multiple formats and whether it was confusing. The thing was something they had put out 15 years earlier, and this was the third incarnation of it mm -hmm. over 15 years. Right. It kind of was, you know, for a lot of people, it was like, I already got that album, you and know? It's, you know, it's 30 million copies later. Yeah. Wide, you know, mm. how many of them you, do you think you can really sell? So between that and doing zero marketing, um, you know, <laughs> it was but a you, problem. But well, there, was, there, was, there was one format that they didn't put out on that, and if, if any album should see this format, it would be one, and that would be a mono version. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be yeah. something. All the singles, just as they originally appeared. You know, when, when we talked same. about the Beatles 1 Plus and its lack of success, part of the reason why, especially you, Al, thought that mm -hmm. it didn't do well was because, and this was a surprise to me, but it, it could just very well be true, to people like us, how wonderful it was to see all these videos in the best possible quality and mm -hmm. yet young people today don't care about videos no mm -hmm. so you know you're reaching for the hardcore the older generation that cares about seeing what really was a part of history you know and how ahead of their time the beatles were at putting out videos and promo clips well, but to younger yeah. people it wasn't reaching them the way the beatles one did when it first came out yeah, think about it. We're recording this on the 35th anniversary of the debut of MTV. Yeah. That's right. And it's been some years since MTV showed videos to any great extent, other than the you know the Video Music Awards and maybe an anniversary of you know of themselves, you know on you know like every August 1st. Other than that, they haven't they haven't been in the video business in a long time. So young people that have kind of grown up watching all the other stuff on on MTV, they don't care about videos. Yeah. Well, yeah, you're right about that, Al. And it's it actually speaks to the bigger picture of a lot of a lot of the the uh, larger Beatle memorabilia dealers even say, you know, yeah. people that cared about this are now past all that and yes. you know the next generation of fans doesn't care about i don't know make it up the the gum cards or the, the the halloween costumes or anything yeah that had great appeal to people who lived with it and experienced it and maybe maybe one generation after that you know where people said oh i remember i had that when i was a kid but mm -hmm. you know that's gone you get to a second generation after that it's it's far less it's got far less of a connection and i think that's happened here with with everything but the core product here, and the core product is obviously the the music catalog. Mm -hmm. So uh, that could be, you know, could speak to the video issue as well. Yeah, and you may They're have a lot of young people that may not care about seeing a Beatles concert. Yeah, or hearing a Beatles concert. They're going to yeah. have to put some excitement into the marketing of this thing. I don't know. I mean, I there'll probably be you know TV commercials and stuff with footage, Hollywood Bowl footage and stuff, but they're gonna uh, you're, uh, that failure of One Plus, you know, they're gonna have to look back at that and, and say you know why didn't this work and what can we do to make make this new thing work, and it's not just not just having the movie out there that's gonna do it. I mean, so I don't know. That's gonna be it's gonna be interesting to see where we go where this all goes. But it is exciting, you know, I think for all of us that the Shea concert will be on the big screen. And I'm really looking forward to seeing that. Because yeah. I've never seen that in a movie theater. Oh, I, I think I saw it in a drive-in once. It was probably like a 30th generation print. You know, mm -hmm. those uh, drive-in midnight uh, concert movies. Mm. I know I've seen it on a big screen, but we didn't know then that it, that it should look like it looks now. Mm. You know. Well, I mean, also, though, uh, th th this may seem 
strange for me to say, which I can say now but couldn't say two years ago, but you elitist guys in the big cities, <laughs> you're going to get to see this. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I don't know that this is going to be screened in Portland, Maine. I, or I don't in know. Pittsburgh. I, mean, I kind of doubt it. Bunch of hicks. <laughs> <laughs> I moved to the Midwest. Really? <laughs> How are the moose over there, Alan? Yeah, uh, yeah they're big. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, say actually, hi, say hi to them. Quite a day in New York, you know. I'm planning on spending a, the afternoon in the theater, and then that night, Jeff Lynn rolls into town with the L.O. Mm. here in the oh, big wow. city on uh, on September 16th. So that's that's a full day. <laughs> mm-hmm. Wow. Has has anybody, Steve? Seen a theater list? No, I yeah. have not. Yeah, you know, I looked Nothing. online, and what's kind of weird, the, the closest I found was like a couple of specific theaters, like one in, I don't know, Baltimore or something, and one up in Boston or something, have it listed like in there, you know, hey, you know, make sure you come to the Baltimore Playhouse. We're going to be showing the, the Beatle movie, the Ron Howard thing, you know, dates and times to be announced. They've obviously contracted for it, but there's no schedule that I've been able to find. Mm. I'm sure they're going to uh, post actually, something online. There's got to be something oh, they, they will put online. For sure, for sure. They did actually, something for Rock Show, if you remember. Right. The, the, yeah. Could, yeah. No, for, for, it's just it's too early for it is all. I mean, the, the, yeah. the album is, what, five, six weeks away? So that means the movie is six, seven weeks away. It's it's too early for that. Mm-hmm. If, you go to, if you go to the movie website and uh, you go under book tickets, you can search for the locations and i just tried to do my town and also san francisco and it says unable to search your location so yeah. it might be too early it might be too early yeah. actually um, i looked yesterday and searched i found a movie from 1998 called eight days a week uh, <laughs> uh, teen actually, comedy or something <laughs> that actually, was, uh, actually I, I take it back i'm scrolling down here and there are a lot of british cinemas listed but i don't see any any American uh, at all. Let me see if Belfast, Belfast yeah, the, the Odeon Belfast is listed. And you can buy tickets for the Odeon Belfast if you want. It. guys want to go to Belfast and see it. But, uh, um, yeah, it doesn't look like they have the American, the American uh, theaters listed on the website yet. So It's got to be coming. Yeah, it's got to be. Yeah. It's got to be. Yeah, it'll be coming, that's for sure. All right, before we close, because I know that many of our listeners are salivating right now because they want to know what brute force is really like. Um, <laughs> our own, our own Tom, Tom has the inside story on this. And well, he did. The, the reason why I'm bringing this up is because online I did see a performance of him at the Fest for Beatle fans backing up brute force on acoustic guitar for the King of Fa. That is correct. The, the long... Legend, long lost, legendary Apple single, "The King of Fub" by Brute Force. Brute uh, was an add-on at the um, Festival Beetle fans in, in New York back in April, and he gave a, a quick little talk about his days at Apple and what that was like, and did a set on what's called the Apple Jam stage. And uh, you know, he has a very much a family affair kind of band. It's his daughter. And uh, actually, his grandson, a, a little kid, banging away on a on a toy drum, mm-hmm. um, and he did a few songs and told some stories. And then we had him in uh, what's called the Fabratory to talk about uh, much the same ground. And um, there was an acoustic guitar there, so we weren't going to let him leave without uh, without regaling us all uh, with a with a with an impromptu take of the King of Fa. So. Uh, I, I had the pleasure of accompanying him on the acoustic guitar, and he sang it, and the uh, the rather intimate crowd that we had sang along with every single word of it. <laughs> 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 so uh, it was a lot of fun, actually. Uh, he was he's a charming guy. But uh, are, are there that, any alternate takes that you have that? No, that was a one rehearsed? shot deal. Oh, okay, one <laughs> take. A, totally, a, yeah, one shot, no rehearsal, right? <laughs> no lessons. Um, no, but. Um, and that will not be part of the Scotch Plainsman set coming up, uh, no. in case you must know, Ken. Yes, Ken, I don't know if you saw the um, the post for our show coming up. Uh, time for just a quick plug mm-hmm. uh, with Pat Tanizio's band, the Scotch Plainsmen. We'll be opening up for the Smithereens, Pat's main gig, on mm. Labor Day weekend at the Wonder Bar. Ken, do you know where that is? No, I do not. It's in Asbury Park, right, very near where you bought the uranium field. 
<laughs> I get it. There's your honeymooners line. I couldn't wait to get that in. <laughs> so, anyway, for the New Jersey listeners, if you're around uh, Labor Day weekend, we'll be there at the Wonder Bar in Asbury Park. Actually, we, the Scotch Plainsmen, always do a Beatles themed set. And because that will be the week coinciding with the end of the Beatles touring years proper, see how we link that back to the Hollywood Bowl? Um, <laughs> we'll be recreating the Candlestick Park set list. So okay. uh-huh. that will be our that'll be our set before the before the guys who know how the the smithereens they come on and uh, and bring the house down after that. Tom, that'll be very good, sir. Very good, sir. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this has been a tremendous show. So uh, if you would like to get in touch with us, we do have an email address for the show. It's things we said today radio show at gmail dot com. Also remember, we have our own Facebook page at Things We Said Today, and we have a Twitter account, which is what, Steve? Things We Said Fab. <laughs> Maybe one of these years I'll remember it. <laughs> and okay. uh, if, if you would like to get in touch with Steve, you can do so how? You can write me at uh, BeatlesExaminer at gmail.com. I may eventually change that email address, but for now I'm going to stick with it. And you can also catch me on Facebook on my, on my real name page. And uh, also, I have a Beatles news group uh, where we talk about Beatles news, be- uh, Beatles news and commentary, and uh, feel free to do, to join up. Mm-hmm. And as for you, Al? Uh, you can contact me through Facebook, uh, Al Sussman, um, or on Twitter at ASUSS49, or uh, through Beatle Fan Magazine, www.beatlefan. Uh, dot com or uh, www.paradingpress.com for uh, changing times 101 days that shape the generation that uh, in fact in another 10 days you could pick up at the Fest for Beatles fans in, at the higher Regency O'Hare in Chicago yes come As visit us I was about to seg that into Tom since you and Tom will both be there <laughs> That's right. you, you didn't let me do that though but anyway since Tom you're oh, going to well. be at the Fest first of all people want to get in touch with you how can they do that uh, best way is through brunchradio.com. Nice and simple. Brunchradio.com. We have a contact us page. Click on the most handsome guy you can find, and it'll get to me. Uh, it'll go through Donnie, then Joe, then ultimately to me, I suppose. <laughs> so that's how to get us. And all, also, obviously, in person, just in a couple weeks, at the Chicago Higher Agency O'Hare, as Al mentioned, uh, at the Fest for Beetle Fans, a big 40th fest in Chicago. We'll have Klaus Vorman there. We'll have Peter Asher there, Billy J. Kramer. Lots of great guests. Pat Denizio is coming out to do a, a set as well. It's going to be a, a terrific time. And we will also be covering the Hollywood Bowl and the Pure mm-hmm. McCartney. I'll have sessions on those in the Fabratory. Lots of fun and games. More fun than we should be allowed to have. Mm. So you should have done the Pure McCartney show here on this show with us, Tom. Well, we we'll have, have to invite you back that. for that. We we have the, the New York that was a, not again. Uh, no, yes, we, we, we did that one in New York at the fest. That was actually I thought pretty pretty. Oh, well it was done. good, but that that wasn't recorded for this show, so well, we'll have I to do it over every, again. I can't do everything. <laughs> I'm brushing my hair that week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. same here. No, Alan? actually, we're, we're going to have the the pure McCartney thing in the Fabratory. For those that don't know how the Fabratory works, it's very interactive. So I'll. I'll be the the host or the the moderator and talk about you know what it is for some people who might not know the full story. You, know, you not not everyone is so uh, ravenous for this stuff as we all are, and and explain why it's been to put it mildly controversial among diehard McCartney fans. Mm-hmm. And and then we'll have the interactive part. You know, with uh, gee, what are a couple of your Paul, favorite Paul McCartney songs that didn't make it on here? Because you know, it's not strict criteria of, boy, it had to be a, a top ten hit or anything. It's clearly not that. Um, but it, for the free form or, you know, uh, playlist type nature of it, you know, is somebody going to raise their hand and say, gee, I wish Daytime Nighttime Suffering was on there. That's pretty good. Um, you know, we'll go through that and see what people, you know, really would have liked to seen on there. Well, that's what I've been trying to get these guys to do on the show. Yeah. Anyway, uh, Alan, <clears throat> Alan, how's by you? Okay, you can 
You can reach me on Facebook at either Alan Cozen or my alter ego, Alan Cozen Remixed. <laughs> uh, I'm on Twitter at, at Cozen. Um, you could write to all my editors and say that they should have more stuff behind me if you want. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but that, that basically will, will do it. And in today's, as again, as we're taping, we're taping this on August 1st, and in today's New York Times, there is, in fact, a, uh, a piece that Alan did on uh, his, uh, well, on the 10th anniversary of love, and uh, it's, it's not a review, but it's a kind of a, an all-purpose kind of summing up of love after 10 years. Critics Notebook, they call it. And yes, actually, it's in the, in the physical paper, August 2nd. It's online today. Oh, okay. Yes. Great. Uh, it's online forever, actually. And who, who are we going to see at MetLife next week? I mean, uh, out of the five of us. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be there. I'm I going. Will. I'm going. Kenny, you'll be there. Very yep. good. Anyone else joining us? Steve, you flying in from the other coast to join us at this? No. No, no I'm not, unfortunately. No. Alan or Al? Nope, sadly no. Oh, will, right. will Ricky Glover be there? That if I'm a gambling man and I am, <laughs> say, I will say yes. Should I don't know that eggs. for sure, for sure, but I'm gonna guess yes. <laughs> you Although think the a, chances are are a hundred percent that he'll be there? The nine, chances are, you know, must be nine out of ten, Ken, or maybe, maybe even higher than that. <laughs> <laughs> You're stealing my lines, Tom. <laughs> Jesus. It's no fun. Nine out of ten will be good. <laughs> anyway. yeah, like, it's like asking if Bob Gannon will be there, our good friend Bob. Bob will be there. Mm-hmm. Okay. Right. Bob will be there for sure. Right. So that's a home game for him. I mean, God, it's Jersey. Yeah. He's a guy that yes. will see him in China or wherever he's played. You know, so, uh, <laughs> Bob will be there. So you All can't right. miss him. Bob's bigger than a bread box. <laughs> okay. And uh, as for me, Ken Michaels, if you would like to email me, my direct email is every little thing at att.net. You can also visit my website, which is kenmichaelsradio.com. Now, as a matter of fact, since we're mentioning Beetle Fan and the Fest for Beetle Fest, I should point out that on my website, on my trivia page, I now have... See, I'm moving into the digital age here, boys. Oh, my goodness. Mm. Uh-oh. Well, Bruce Spizer will be a guest at yes. the Fest, Whoa. and I'm giving away the Beatles story on Capitol Records Part 2, the albums, the digital edition. Yes. Now on my website, as well as Kiddo Tools book, songs you were singing, guided tours to the Beatles' lesser known tracks. So that's amongst the many prizes that uh, you can win on my weekly Beatles trivia. And I also have a page now because I've actually been getting some new stations taking every little, every little thing. And nice. there's one page that lists all my affiliate stations. So if you want to catch the show and every radio station that, that signs up for it, can play any one of my shows they want to. So you can hear different shows at different times during the week. It's not all the same. But yeah. there is a page there for that. That's awesome. Yeah. It's one station out of Maui. Let's hear it from Maui. Let's hear it from Maui. Right. Maui. Yeah. Maui. Ken, Maui. Maui. Ken, Maui. gone tropo. Ken has officially Ken. gone tropo. As a matter <laughs> of fact, that my wife Joanne and I were, were Mauied in Maui. Right? And uh, we were, and um, we the the one solo Beatles mm. CD I took with me, mm. was Gone Trapo, which we I played bet. when we were there, and we were married on the beach on Maui, and we had four uh, wedding wedding songs, and it was one from each Beatle. That's very nice. Wow. Right there. What was I the never... Ringo song? I have to know. You never know. That's pretty good. From mm. Curly Sue, That's... because of the words in there. But That's the real cool thing which I always like to bring up about my wedding songs, is that the one song from John that I picked was Grow Old With Me. And in the lyrics, he says, face the setting sun when the day is done. And as that song's playing, the sun's setting. That's nice. Uh, <laughs> we didn't plan that, but that's just the way it was. Yeah, I had, I had Grow Old With Me as my wedding song. Didn't work out too good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. Yeah. I hope that doesn't bounce off on me. But anyway. No, no, you, you will have much, you already have had much better luck with it than me. I know. I've been married 14 years. My God. Wow. Yeah. All right. So this has been great, Tom. It has been wonderful having you on the show. My pleasure as always, gentlemen. Come Good back luck. soon, Tom. Have some fun I, at the Fest for Beetle Fans, which I know you will, and also with your gig with the Scotch Plainsman. 
And again, you want to repeat where that is and the date for that? That's the Wonder Bar in Asbury Park, very near Ken's Uranium Field. That's <laughs> on Sunday night of Labor Day weekend, so it'll be September 4th. We'll be opening up for the fabulous Smithereens. Care for any no-cal pizza there, uh, Tom? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I got some right here they for have, you. They have, a, they have a cool dressing room at this place. They have wallpaper that glows in the dark. <laughs> no need for electric lights. <laughs> it's all honeymooners lines coming out of us right now. Anyway... <laughs> This has been great. So, for Steve Marinucci, Alan Cozen, Al Sussman, and Tom Franjone, this is Ken Michaels thanking you so much for listening, and we will see you next time. Rx. Rx.